So welcome to the podcast of Female Talent Journeys to Success with Barbie, who's part of Zodia Markets today. So first and foremost, thank you so much for joining. It will probably be good just to do a couple of introductions from both of our sides uh, and I'll run over the agenda in a little bit more detail as well. Um, but just to kick us off, so I'm Anna, I work for Interquest, I'm based in the Netherlands. Uh, Interquest is a search consultancy company and I manage their risk regulation and compliance practice across Europe. Um, sitting down with Barbie today, we're going to be looking at her journey, kind of where you started uh, and ultimately how you got to where you are today. And then having worked as a contractor in the background across quite a multitude of different projects, encompassing a variety of different roles. What was the most interesting and impactful areas of transformation that you've been involved in um, and what kept you in the contract world? And then more importantly, what brought you into the permanent world? What was it that interested you to, to go into permanent employment aside from project based work? And then working for Zodia Markets, who are clearly part of a bigger brand, what are the key areas of development and transformation there? And then it's always good to just to run over the ch biggest challenges you've had in your career because I think they're good to highlight as well as the biggest successes and kind of what kept you motivated to progress to where you are today. And then any words of encouragement for the female industry or just the broader industry to say, hey, look, I am here. I am the C COO. You can get to these types of positions. It's not sometimes always easy, but if you continuously progress, you know, I always say, what would you have said to your younger self looking backwards now? which I think is always a really interesting topic. But uh, I'll hand over to you for an introduction uh, and then we'll take it from there. Hi, hi Anna. Um, thanks for having me on this. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Um, yeah, I'm Bavi Hadani. I am the COO for Zodium Markets. Uh, Zodium Markets is a crypto trading business backed by Standard Chartered and um, providing market access to institutions. Uh, we launched in uh, September 2022 now, I think it was. Um, yeah, and so we're going from strength to strength. Thank I'm fairly you. young, but in the crypto world, we're, we're probably ancient by now, I would think. But yeah. <laughs> I always kind of wonder what makes it ancient in the crypto world these days, because it's, there's so much evolving, but also right. so many players popping up from bigger institutions. Yeah. It's, you know, what's new, what's old, I don't think anyone has a clear line but i suppose taking it back a little bit as to kind of how you ended up at sodium markets uh it'd be mm -hmm. good just to run through your journey and in a little bit more depth where you started and how you got to where you are today uh wow <laughs> i started a long time ago like seriously <laughs> if we think that zodium markets is ancient we're just being a, a couple of years old Right, I'm pro I'm probably a dinosaur, but um, no, I have um, I started uh, as a developer, actually straight out of university. Um, I was a Java developer for about eight or nine years, um, working um, in finance. I've always been on the intersect of finance and technology. Mm -hmm. um, ever since I've started my career and so starting off as a developer and then moving on to doing more analysis work and then taking on more responsibility as like delivery from a project management perspective and then moving into bigger programs and bigger deliveries and more transformational um, uh, initiatives as well and so yeah it's I've always like I said always been the intersect of technology and finance throughout my whole career so it's it just seems like a natural progression yeah. yeah no of course and I suppose looking at that as well because I always find it really interesting when you look at the coding side of it and although completely completely different to you I used to come from a technology recruitment background so I am more interested in the digital side of finance yeah I'm kind of the integration how both worlds meet and I also think it makes it a little bit more agile and innovative so with the transformations you would have been a part of from that what would you have say or saw was the most interesting or the biggest transformation kind of how that works in an organization yeah I mean it's really interesting that you say that like I'm coming from a tech background and like I, like I said 
always on the. I mean, I'm not a coder <laughs> for sure. But... <laughs> well, my, so I was a coder for about eight or nine years, and I have to be brutally honest with myself. I wasn't a very good coder, to be honest. I don't know how I managed to last um, for about nine years before I, I suddenly went, okay, my skills are better used elsewhere. Yeah. <laughs> to be honest, I'm a, like you know, I, I love problems. I love to solve problems. Um, yeah, and so this was just another way of being able to solve these problems rather than actually coding to solve them. I was able to come up with solutions um, and design uh, some of the, the solutions. But yeah, um, in terms of like, I've worked in transformation programs throughout my whole career, effectively, whether it's being um, sort of front office based or back office or front to back, it's I've had it a wide variety of experience there um with regards to uh, where i think the most impact is on transformation and i find this i was really thinking about this because i know that um we were sort of talking about that this would come up um i have to actually say my biggest transformation challenge and the where i see the biggest impact is what i'm doing today it sounds really boring and sounds so obvious, but I think that um, uh, transformation is hard everywhere you go. I think particularly with the bigger firms, um, but working for a smaller firm right now to be able to to be involved in a transformation program um, is is really exciting. And what we're doing at Zodia Markets is is really impactful. We're able to. Um, the, the the work that we're doing around stable coins and FX is really going to start impacting the market as a whole. Mm. And I think that's that's pretty amazing. Um, whereas previous transformation programs were all around like efficiencies within those organizations and within the institutions yeah. as opposed to any kind of market impact. So they're different types of um, impact that they have, but um, I have to say that the most exciting is what I'm doing right now. I think because of the the external market impact that we could have, it's it's pretty it's pretty special. But yeah, it's um yeah, no, I can imagine that as well because obviously when you and like you quite rightly referenced, and we've been looking at it quite a lot from an internal perspective at the moment, is the bigger corporations tend to look at a transformation just in terms of efficiencies and processes that they already yeah. have in place, and yeah. it's just around making it far quicker or if there is becoming quite a volatile market so particularly in like market disruption yeah. or technology disruption how big a business is kind of embed that into a process try trying to it's be a little hard. bit more agile <laughs> whereas in smaller organizations it's around product development market penetration yeah. and market development at the same time yeah and those tend to be a lot more agile and a lot more quick with a finger to the pulse in terms of technology adoption and rollout yeah. which is where you start seeing these bigger names fading a little bit in terms of having that competitive advantage from a big brand name yeah. and people moving more towards the smaller brand names just because of how much smoother it is into the market and we're in a digital era now if you kind of rewind 10 years we wasn't really that digitalized whereas now people don't want to look people in the face if we can do it online we want to do it online and I think that's where the transformation starts getting a little bit more integral now and mm. probably a lot more exciting because there's probably a lot of smaller transformations as well as bigger transformations in yeah. a smaller company. Yeah, exactly. And it's really interesting. Um, and that's why it's so interesting being part of Standard Chartered. We've been backed by Standard yeah. Chartered as well, because like they recognize that, you know, to have um, to have real impact and real transformation, you know, they need to invest in some of the smaller and um, smaller entities and having the foresight to go, OK, right, you know, I think, you know, the digital asset space is where it's all going to be. And they and actually incubating these ventures yeah. to do that work for them, that, that they're smaller and leaner um, is, is incredible. And it gives you that kind of. Um, it's exciting. It, it's mm. really exciting to work for because you know you've got the backing of Standard Chartered and yet we're lean enough to be able to move quickly. Um, you know, that, that comes with its own challenges as well yeah. because <laughs> you kind of go, 
you know, um, we are small, we're a startup, you want to have a startup mentality, you want to fail fast. Um, and then sometimes you have, you know, your parents looking over you, which yeah. is, you know, it, so you can't, you can't go as fast as I guess a normal startup could go, but at the same time, um, one of the appealing things around about Zodiac Markets um, is that because we are backed by Standard Chartered, we have bank grade like risk and compliance and controls governance. Yes, right? governance it's bank system. grade. It's it's not um, you know your average or normal startup. Um, we we know what look what good looks like. Um, and we're uh, we're held accountable to yeah. that. And so that's so you know that those that's the flip side of that being able it to move fast. It kind of has the security because of the the parent, yeah. Uh, but it also has the agility to move at a pace that you need, which I think is adding a benefit, and people will really yeah. like. And one thing I do want to touch on, just that you just said, is that you want to fail fast. Obviously, where you've been a part of big organisations and smaller organisations, what's the view or the differentiation of views in terms of failure from these two types of companies? Ooh. I think for a startup, it's almost expected. You want to yeah. be able to try things quickly and you want that very quick feedback loop, right? Is Because you, you have to be very client focused. Mm -hmm. as well what do the clients want what what problem are you trying to solve for um and i think you get that feedback loop really quickly and you have to learn you have to be lean enough and nimble enough to be able to pivot really quickly and i think um that's the advantage of a startup with corporates um and like bigger organizations um I think some, like you said, they are trying to, a lot of departments do try to bring in the Agile because that's what Agile is all about. It's all about yeah. having the sprint and making sure that you have that very fast feedback loop and you're able to change um, as you can. Uh, sometimes though, I think some of those corporations are bogged down by a lot of legacy systems that just don't allow them to change mm. that quickly. It's all very, it's, it's nice if you're working in a greenfield environment um, where you're building out brand new systems where they weren't before, but where you're doing transformation and changing legacy systems, it's it's a little bit more of a challenge, I think. Yeah, I would say as well, just from like a transformation perspective, is it does boil down to the systems uh, and the core Absolutely. infrastructure, but it does quite heavily boil down to the people and how their mentality <laughs> is on change as well. So if you have people who are just yeah. very, I mean, it, failure is foreign to them accepting and wanting to look at kind of failing because then mm. you look at the progression and what went wrong went didn't it is for like it is foreign to them they don't want to do that they're afraid and almost quite standoffish so I suppose looking at it from an integration of the people side does that yeah. alter the way that transformation's done or how would that be looked upon um I think um I think it does. I think, like like I said, I think most, if in the startup environment, most people understand that mistakes are going to be made. We may yeah. go down a, a route that, you know, that wasn't quite right. Um, and that's okay. That that should be okay. We should be allowed to um, pivot and change our minds and then work out because, you know, the market is constantly changing. And as we've just talked about, right, the crypto market changes all the time. And what okay, might I mean, be someone right, that says I'm an expert, I will call them a liar. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, right? Like something that was that we thought would work six months ago may not work in the next six months. And so we we have to we have to change. Like we recognize that Zodia markets that actually a lot of the clients that we were talking to really wanted the, the key thing for them was um getting great effects and great getting um you know faster settlement times so that's what we're focusing on and we know and that's where we're getting our our demand it wasn't what we were thinking nine months ago no. <laughs> at all but um and i love that i love the fact that we've got okay so that didn't work we know that these guys are coming to us because they want this and we're able to change. I think with bigger places, it's really difficult to get that feedback, really difficult to get that kind of feedback quickly. Yeah, mm -hmm. because 
I, I do see what you mean there as well, because then it's, you know, how close are you to the clients? How yes. how kind of open ears are we to what do they want? What do they need? Where are we going? And I think mm. that's them saying, and I think even the clients at the moment, particularly in that world, they don't know what they're doing six to nine months from now. So how can we give them a solution which they can use for a five-year plan when they can hardly create a one-year yeah. plan? And I think that's yeah. where the change in market landscape is coming from as well. Yeah, exactly. And I think, you know, the, the and I, I think it's starting to change now a little bit, certainly as um, some of the corporations are doing more like departmental agile work. Um, but, I, the, but the whole idea of having a 12 month project plan makes me like send shivers down my back sometimes i think having a 12 month roadmap makes sense and having like you know a north star having a goal and an objective i get that um but i really like the idea of like reviewing and reassessing your goals and objectives far more frequently than on a 12 month basis. <laughs> I find it, yeah. And that's what I do love about you know, working for uh, a startup in a smaller environment because there's some, you know, you have to be more open to going, okay, let's review. Where are we for this quarter? Does this look like we're still, our goals and our objectives make sense? Nope. Yeah. Don't. Let's, let's just adjust. And I suppose with the COO role that you you have at the moment with Zodiac, COO can mean so much. And I'm probably <laughs> going to open a can of worms because it probably <laughs> does here as well. But what does that kind of mean for your role in terms of what what you're doing at Zodiac? I mean, uh, to, yeah, you're absolutely right. It can mean many different things to many different people. Um, I think what I what I'm finding as a COO is actually it's not very it's not too dissimilar to what I was doing as a contractor. I guess it's just a bit more of a wider remit. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think that you know you it's it's very much about um, I hate to say this term and I really know this term is like being a jack of all trades. You kind of need yeah. to know like um be able to roll your sleeves up and be able to get involved with anything and everything like i have multiple hats <laughs> yes. at any one time um and it's about understanding the organization that you that you're in and understanding its you know um its flaws its efficiencies and you know how my biggest goal for this year is ensuring that as a company that we're able to scale because now is the point. We spent the last couple of years building. Now we want to scale. Um, but yeah, it's like I said, it's different for many people, I think. Yeah. But I see I this, suppose... my role as, a, as an execution role. It's like and I'm does... there to deliver. Yeah. And does that role change as you go from build to scale? Um, does it change? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's like a million dollar question. <laughs> yeah, it does to some extent. It, it does to some extent um, because your focus changes. I yeah. think when you're building, it's about making sure that you're relied and people understand that what what's the value, what the value is in what we're building and making mm -hmm. sure that the processes and procedures and everything are in place. Now, what inevitably happens is, you know, you you find that sometimes those processes and procedures that are put in place aren't ju just aren't able to scale. So yep. your focus just completely changes and you're like, okay, so now where can I start being more efficient? Like where, where we put this in place, was that the right thing to do? Was it not? Like, like I said, I think for the, for the build part, you're focused on the product. Yeah. And now we're focused on like making sure that we can do more of it. <laughs> No, of course. I, I just find transformation absolutely fascinating because I, I really, I, I'm not, I don't enjoy BAU consistently. So when you kind of understand it from a change and transformation perspective, it's always something I, I can just talk about all day or ask people yeah. questions about all day. So I'll try yeah. and keep it less so for you. <laughs> no, but it, um, it is, it is one of those things, right? Like no day is the same ever, yeah. ever. And you kind of, and I, I love that, and I've always loved that. And, so, and I suppose and as well, where where you are at that 
permanent side at the moment, but you you referenced this already yourself. You you were in contract work for for a while. How did you find it in the contract world doing the transformation piece and, and kind of then looking for next projects? So I think uh, contracting um, and working for transformation programmes is really interesting because as a contractor and running transformation, you often, um, particularly with big corporations, it's really difficult to garner, um, like to support, garner support. Yeah sometimes it's like you know they um you want to bring everybody onto the same page you've got to bring everybody along on the journey yet you're a contractor and so you're always perceived as an outsider or you're there just to do the job and you have no real accountability there are all of these negative connotations i think that come with being a contractor um but I've always loved that because I've always liked to push against that that kind of stereotype. Um, yeah. It's not my style at all. I'm a big advocate of leading without uh, without authority. I'm a yeah. bit like you know I get a lot of questions around, oh like you know like you should have this title, you should have that title. Now I and I always like question whether you know you want to manage or whether you want to lead. If you mm -hmm. want to lead, you can lead without a title. And there are yeah. various ways that you can do that. And as a contractor, you have to become very, um, you, you sort of uh, hone your skills around that and learning how to influence without sort of saying, well, I'm such and such. And so you must do what I, what I tell you to do. <laughs> a lot of it is around influencing and like bringing people along on the same page and along the journey with you. And so, yeah, I, I love that part about being a contractor. Um, and I think that's really helped me in the role that I'm in at the moment, actually, because part of my job is to make sure that people are on the same page. Actually, a lot of my job is to make sure that, <laughs> that everybody's on the same page and that we're all driving towards the same goal. Um, yeah, it's, it's part of my job that I love the most, I think. I think it's what separates managers and, and leaders as well. Because yeah. the, the managers are the dictators, like you've said, and I think that was a stereotype which we kind of embedded a, a long time ago. Uh, and now more, as the industries have changed, leaders are needed more because yeah. it is around bringing people on board. It is around having that influence, not a dictatorship, but how can we do it together? How can we do it better? How can we all get where we all want this to go? And I think that's where it's slightly changed as well. And I think people underestimate the emphasis on contractors to have to do that because ultimately we know contractors they are brought in for a problem they're not yeah. brought in just for a nicety of a business there is a problem and there is a, a need and demand that's pretty urgent yeah. and needed now and there's a whole load of expertise there where you would have seen it from so many different challenge points where you really understand how that actually works from bigger corporations and how it can be used in smaller ones yeah. And then bringing all those people on board, particularly with your bigger corporates, can probably be a little bit more harder. <laughs> yeah, it can be. <laughs> I think it's, it's um, but that's one of the best things about that challenge, right? And I think, yeah. like, like I said, I think um, being able to uh, lead without authority requires you to really understand the organisation and understand the problem um, as well. And then sit, sitting down with those SMEs is really interesting. It's really like you can really get to, OK, so what is the problem? How do we yeah. solve this together? Um, yeah, and that's that's the best part of what I do. I still do that. Like I said, I'm a jack of all trades. I don't really I'm not an SME in any area, any specific <laughs> area. Um, but yeah, I find it fascinating what other people know and, you know, how they address problems as well. And so it's been really, yeah, really cool. It is interesting. I think with transformation as well, you kind of can't specialise because every <laughs> type of transformation is different. So you do kind of need to be a jack of all trades to be able to identify, solve and deploy. Yeah, yeah, you do. And you have to constantly, like you said, like sitting down with the SMEs and you have to constantly ask questions. I mean, and I, 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 <laughs> I will be the first one to hold my hand up and ask a really stupid question. I think sometimes it will be like, <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, I don't understand. And I think that's okay. I think that's perfectly fine. Because if you don't ask, then how will you ever know? Um, 
And I think that you do need to know, you need to ask some of those stupid questions because people are so afraid. They're really yeah. afraid to sort of hold their hand up and say, look, I don't understand this. Can somebody explain it to me? Um, and that's okay because you can't, you can't know everything and you can't deliver change or affect change without speaking to other people and what their problems are and their pain points are either. And no, so I, it's really important. I also think there's, it comes back to that saying, doesn't it? Of no question is a stupid question. And if you're asking that question, there's probably someone else in the room thinking about that <laughs> as well. Yeah. <laughs> you just are a little bit too reserved to put their hands up and I ask stupid questions all the time. If you ask my boss, they would definitely agree. Um, Even now, I'm they, doing, I like all the time, every day. I don't think a day goes past when I'm going, what was that? What, is this? <laughs> <laughs> what does that it's, mean? <laughs> and they're like, are, are you okay? I'm like, <laughs> I don't know myself anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think that's fine. I think it's it's normal. And I worry yeah. when people don't ask questions, when they just look quiet and they just... I worry if I've just said stuff right. <laughs> you, have I explained this in the correct way or have I just said loads of mumbo jumbo? <laughs> yeah, but I think that's the thing though, right? What I'm finding is that a lot of people do just say mumbo jumbo and everybody just goes, oh, okay, that's fine. Yeah. Like, no, no wait, worries, I'll do it by Friday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's almost like, oh, okay. Because they're too afraid sometimes to go, I don't understand what you've just said. <laughs> yeah, little red flag moment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And I suppose from all of that as well, just from a contract side and, and the benefits and also the challenges that came with it, what, what made you look at getting into a more permanent was there anything in particular that kind of changed your mindset to want to go in that direction or? Um, yeah, yeah, it was, it was a very much a conscious decision for me. Um, as much as I love being a contractor and I was a contractor for like 15 years mm -hmm. ish round about, um, I, like I said, as a contractor, you're very much aware that you are still perceived as an outsider. You're very much aware that, you know, um, that as a contractor, you don't you don't really have any skin in the game. You don't have any accountability. Now, that, that's not how I worked. Um, yeah. And that's but that's the kind of perception that that you have. You are, like you said, you're there. To, you're coming to fix a problem and then that's it. And then you'll go. Mm -hmm. um, but I. I wanted to put the same amount of effort in and the same amount of blood, sweat and tears, but no, knowing that I was building something that I could be proud of and be a part of. And that I had some belonging. Do you, do you know what I mean? It's like you, I wanted yeah. to, and so for me, it had to be for um, somewhere that was smaller, somewhere that um, I could really make effective change i think that was the key part for me it was like where i want to be um if i'm going to go perm i'm going to go perm because i can make some real impactful change as a yeah perm. And like because, a longer term impactful change rather yes. than just a short term and then it just waits yes. until the next sort of inefficiency exactly until i go to the next role where i can make yeah. a change <laughs> next one i mean like i know there are there are um, programs that I worked on I think, 10 years ago that are still going, which is nice, which is great. Uh, it does that's been 10 years of like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and they're all talking about, oh, but that's a legacy system now. And I'm like, oh God. That's a legacy system. Did you just call me legacy? It's like you take your <laughs> arrow to the heart. <laughs> exactly. Um, but it's, yeah, it's, but for me, it was actually where I can make a long term, make a long, long term impactful change and that I can, um really be part of something and really build something no, i like that and i suppose that that ties in quite nicely to my next question we, we've we've touched across this a little bit as well but it's just around you know working for, for zodiac markets there's obviously quite a lot of change there and you are part of a bigger group but you have the kind of benefit and outlook that they see you as as kind of what you are and uh, able to help support that with a branding perspective 
But what would the key areas of development be for you in, in kind of this permanent role? And what is that everlasting change with, with Zodia? Or impact, shall we say? Simply, simply, simply. Ooh. Oh, that is hard. Is that great? I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> that is hard. I mean, the key development areas for me, it, it, this, is, this is the thing. And I think um, what what's really interesting, um, and I said this quite recently as well to somebody, is that you know people sort of say, okay, so what do you see? Like, where do you see us? And what do you want to do like in 12 months time? Like in the role that I'm in and also how fast we're going at Zodia, it's sometimes very difficult to see past that day because things yeah. are going so fast on that day. Um, but from a development perspective, it's, you know, I would be happy if I can make sure that um, we're able to scale and actually reach clients and um, sectors that um, really make a change um, to people. Like we're, we're focusing on corporates at the moment, we're focusing on cross-border payments with the stablecoin piece. And I think that stuff is just truly fascinating and could make a massive impact to the market as a whole. Um, and that, so. that to me is what really drives me. Like where can we as Zodia Markets make a real change um and i think my my goal is just to make sure how how do i em enable the team to get there yeah i think it's also around like how are we benefiting it's like you're, you're impacting and the change is all focused on what can we do and how can we help yeah Which how do we solve a problem yeah and i think that's where people sometimes have i always say like blinkers on because it's not really looking how can we solve this problem it's how can we make as much money as quickly as possible and gain as much market share at the fastest yeah. pace which i think is where quite a lot of people particularly during covid those ones got yeah. kind of shaken off uh, and now you have the people who are really looking at the impact of the market and the benefit that they can bring yeah. to build a stabilized business in a fast changing economy and be able to actually keep up with it yeah, I mean, I, I, like I said, I love what we're doing here. Like we found, we recognize that there's a problem with correspondent yeah. banking. We know that we, we've got efficiencies around um, uh, cross-border payments that we can help with. Um, that not just only helps the corporate sector, but also like we, like last year, we kicked off this um, uh, initiative, Crypto for Good, uh, in yeah. collaboration with Make-A-Wish. Um, and although that was focused in the UK to allow Make-A-Wish to accept donations in crypto, we um, also recognise that actually what we're doing with the corporates could be really beneficial for um, not-for-profits uh, that are in like the sub-Sahara region or like anywhere else in the world yeah. where they need to accept donations uh, quickly and the, and also the disbursement of donations as well because donors want to know where is the, where are those donations going and they have a way of doing that with crypto or it's a little bit easier than with crypto than it is with fiat but so there are many um many things that we can do and there's so much utility around what we're building at the moment it's really it's exciting it's really exciting how did you find the not-for-profit view on using crypto is what I want to know when you first went to Yeah, it's really challenging. It's still challenging today, right? I think, yeah. and quite rightly, um, uh, I think that quite rightly or wrongly, to be, let me <laughs> say that clearly, um, I think, you know, as trustees of the board, and I'm a trustee myself, yeah. um, you have to be careful because the buck stops with you. And so there is a lot of uh, where, like, um, doubt there's a lot of uncertainty about what crypto is and what it can do um, but i think that comes down to education i think that comes down to um, crypto having a bad name and I, I've, I've said this many times before i think crypto needs to go through a rebranding um yeah to be honest um and it's all about education uh, it's educating the boards of these not-for-profits making them realize like, like and making them understand the utility making them understand that actually it's not as um it's not just for like drugs and trafficking at all 
no. at all. Um, but that's all they hear about, right? I think that's I think people thing. worry about the safeguarding of it as well because there's been so many stories and there's obviously what you just referenced as well. But if it's online and I lose my phone or if it goes somewhere else, how do you track it? Can you track it? Is it, you know? Yeah. And I think the only thing you can do to migrate around that is what you said is just the rebranding of it and the repositioning of it in people's minds and, and out into the market. Massively. It's because they don't know. People are, and it's human nature, right? You're always going to be afraid of things that you're not, you don't know anything yeah. about. And so, um, you know, we do think um, at Zodium Markets, we spend a lot of time, uh, Nick, one of our co-founders, spends a lot of time um, doing talks to boards um, and to people who are just interested actually like a little from education, bit about it, from it? an education like perspective educating people yeah um and so that's yeah that that i think is is the part that although when we first started off talking for not for profits that was that was very much a concern you can see now that things are very so slightly starting to change at a glacier pace but they are starting to change with you know they are um coming to us and saying well, we're interested and that would be because um it's primarily because they recognize that there is a stream of donations that they haven't tapped into yet. And given where we are with, you know, the cost of living and everything like that, you know, the, the charity space need to look at diverse ways of getting these donations in. I also think that's really interesting because I haven't spoken to, to a company like this who have looked at the institutional market and the not-for-profit i think that's one that's kind of been neglected a little bit when going down the crypto route as to one it could actually have an impactful benefit for and it's like you meet you said earlier it's, it's meaningful and impactful change yeah and it probably supports a lot more there so it's quite interesting that you're going down that way and it'd be even more interesting to see how that develops over time and like you said the mindsets are even starting to shift now yeah. so as soon, it, it, as soon as one shifts and someone else does it, you see a peak of interest from another thinking, well, if they're doing it. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. And I think it just comes down to, like, you know, what problems are we trying to solve? And yeah. we know that, you know, this this problem that we're trying to solve for corporates is actually just the same problem for not-for-profits. Yeah. It really is. It's the same It's the same solution for not-for-profits. Um, it just takes, you know, it a little bit more peripheral work to try and like bring them up to speed come along with a journey you know, there's a lot more coming along with the journey as well um but you'd be surprised as well i think the corporates as well have um some reservations so there's a lot of education all around i think but yeah i think you know i think that's that is changing that is changing which is good yeah no it is i, I think that ties in quite nicely as well with looking at your career from everything that you've been involved in and the, the kind of challenges that you're having today, what has been your biggest challenges? And I think it's really important to look at your biggest success in your career journey. Mm. <laughs> Everyone always hates this question because it's talking really, about you're yourself. You're asking me really tough questions. Um, <laughs> I'll tell you, and, and, I, and I've touched upon this a little bit as well, I think sometimes um, the biggest challenge is working for a big corporation and moving the needle. Yeah. Moving the needle to really make that change, um, because that can take a really long time, um, a lot longer than you would really like and so you have to draw on some like some of the other skills that we talked about like influencing skills and all that to just try and make a difference and I'm a big or I'm also a very big advocate of like you know um uh, the one percent change if you keep making one percent changes that will have a bigger impact overall yeah. it's not all about the big bang it's all about making small incremental changes um but I, I find that has always been the biggest challenge for uh, in change and always and for bigger working for bigger corporations um and what was the next question your biggest <laughs> success <laughs> my biggest success oh wow um, <laughs> it's so funny how you can always talk about like work and what's going well and what's done this and how the careers but then as soon as someone has to think about their biggest success in their career it's the one where everyone's always like Hmm. <laughs> because it's talking yeah. about kind of your your own 
personal like achievements as well, isn't it? Yeah, it, I think that is very difficult. I think particularly for women, it's very difficult yeah. to talk about your own personal achievements. <laughs> um, and I think um, it, it really depends on what we, what how we like um, assess success. I think really, like I, I think that. Um, I treat me, me being part of like uh, being a trustee on a board and working that is is a massive success for me because I love that it feeds my soul but at the same time uh, I feel like I'm pretty successful working for Zodiac Markets given the fact that I love waking up and working every day. That is something which is a really big benefit to have which I would probably say not a lot of people would be able yeah. to say and so from uh, a personal success right? like yeah I I love what I do I love what we do as a firm um and every day is yeah I, I really I, I enjoy every day which is very well that's actually really nice to hear as well <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah, it's, it's, this is, yeah, I feel very, yeah, I feel, yeah, very lucky. Good. And I'm sure that they feel even luckier to have you, so. <laughs> I don't know. I would say I that about some of that. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll see. We won't ask them directly. <laughs> yeah. When I'm chasing them down for things, it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I suppose that ties in quite nicely just to, to start wrapping this up as well. Well, if you could go back uh, and give yourself or if you can give words of encouragement to, to kind of people to encourage them to get into this industry, to encourage them to keep progressing to senior leaders positions or encourage them to take the step from the bigger transfer, bigger banks to smaller startups where they may see a little bit of a risk. What would you say as an encouragement to them from what you've learned in the market? Or if you look back, what would you have said? To yourself back then to kind of illustrate the the need to mm. and emphasis to keep going um i tell you what i would have said to myself and to anybody else actually is um don't be afraid to ask for what you want don't be afraid i think as 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 women um we tend to have this view that we would just be recognized for the work that we're doing because it's a meritocracy and we'll just be recognized for it um and so we don't we've already touched upon it we don't really um you know we're not great prs of our own we're not great mm -hmm. pr managers we don't sort of say what we've done we kind of assume people will know what we've done and recognize the value of what we've done um and i kind of feel that uh Instead of asking for what I wanted um, back there and what I wanted to do, I just said, well, you know what, I'm going to take control of my own career and um, go contracting myself. I'm going to go contracting and that way I can control what I want to do, when I want to do it and how I want to do it. I kind of feel like, you know, if I was brave enough to say at that time, actually, this is what I want. This is, yeah. this is the work I've done. This is what I want, and this is what I I I know I can do. This is what I think I can do, but I was just too afraid. I just didn't feel like anybody would listen. I didn't feel like it was. Um, I I felt almost like, well, why can't they see what I've done? Yeah, you're they kind of like waving, like, am yes. I invisible? Or? Yeah, exactly. Well, they they should know what I've done. I've had like my appraisals, and I've had my. You know they should know but i think the challenge is is that sometimes as a manager you don't know unless you're told no you don't you don't know unless you're told and sometimes making the assumption when somebody wants something is just as bad of making the assumption when you think that they don't want something so i think that um or you know you don't want to put them in a in a position where you think that's what they wanted in the first place when when it's not and so um I think it's okay to ask. Don't be afraid. And also, don't be afraid to make mistakes. I think mistakes are always just something to look back on because I I said this to uh, someone else a little while ago as well. Failures are really easy to look at as a learning curve, but we never look at successes as a learning curve. 
because yeah. success you would look back and say okay well what happened here to make it success rather than what happened that failed here and i yeah. think that adds quite a big benefit on it as well but i don't think <laughs> i'll use a good analogy here we blow our own horn enough um to be able to That's say true. no i have done this i do deserve this and actually putting a stronger foot forward to demand what you want but not in a way which is you know i need and da, 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 yeah. it's being able to illustrate and show what you've been able to do yeah and just be a promoter of yourself but in a, a positive way yeah I don't, we definitely I don't, don't do enough no we don't. <laughs> no we don't do enough of that at all i think it's um it's really it I think it's just the way that we I think as as women we just think very differently and that that does yeah. need to change that does need to change I think it's slowly starting to like you're seeing a lot more women pushing for promotions and pushing for more responsibility whereas they would yeah. have kind of predominantly just kind of sat in the back and you know yeah you you take that I'll I'll do this and stuff yeah. and I think we're kind of putting our heads on the chopping block a little bit to just see how far we can push ourselves and how yeah. much we can do and you know how much we can learn how much we can contribute and I think that's really interesting yeah yeah I think the other thing is though I think um it, like it's really interesting to say that you're put, like putting our heads on the chopping block I think it's really important to also garner allies as well I think it's yeah you know I think we we forget that there is a lot of support out there mm-hmm you People are more get... willing these days now, rather yeah, than this is my knowledge, so. you keep yours, I keep mine. It's, okay, well, let's see what we can get. Let's see what we can do with two minds or yeah. mentors are becoming more important, even to senior people. Yes. Internal coaching, all of this is becoming so much more available. Are we utilising it to its full of potential? Probably not. But it is definitely yeah. becoming something which is more usable, which is quite nice to see. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, cool. Well, <laughs> thank you so much for joining. It's been a pleasure. And I always find it really fascinating. I felt like on the transformation side, I could have kept you here for three hours. If I was. <laughs> um, and also just to understand from your perspective, how the industry's changed, what brought you into this, what Zodia is more importantly doing at the market and the changes that it has coming from that side, uh, what you're in uh, and kind of focusing on there although it may be short term and then looking at it from a longer term it's interesting to see how each of those two different kind of steps have, have taken a turn and, and how they're progressing into the market and the views you guys have on the market is incredible um but also just i i always find it interesting the question of what you would have told your younger self and that's something i always think is really important to see as well and i, I definitely get where you are coming from yeah. but thank you so much for joining it's been a uh, pleasure well, thank you for having me, Anna. It's, I could have talked for ages, honestly. And there was you worrying about it. <laughs> <laughs>